Good afternoon, my name is Satyan Desai. I'm an engineer on the YUI team. And I'm here today uh, partly because they tricked me into coming up here every year with promises of Kit Kats and uh, Krispy Kreme donuts. And it seems to work, by the way. So um, you know, if you're looking for widget support, I'd write that down, come and helpful. But mainly, I'm here because I spent a couple of months this year working on Yahoo's LiveStand product uh, with the LiveStand performance team. And I thought there was a lot of really useful information to come out of that engagement and out of the LiveStand engineering effort as a whole. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about today, uh, the things we learned um, as we developed LiveStand. So this is what we'll be going over for the next hour or so. Um, as I mentioned, I, I think I'm going to run a little long, so I'll try and squeeze it in. Uh, we might not have time left at the end for Q&A, but we can do that kind of offline. Um, I'll kick it off by uh, providing a quick intro to LiveStand. We'll look at a demo. Uh, it's available on the App Store, so you can, you can uh, pull it down and play with it while I talk. Uh, that'll give you some context for the rest of the engineering conversation. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is uh, the basic technology decision, uh, what we decided to build LiveStand on top of. We'll touch on uh, which core parts of YUI LiveStand ended up using. Um, and then we'll get into some of the interesting findings uh, coming from the LiveStand engineering effort as it pertains to JavaScript, CSS, um, and the rest of the stuff on that list. So what is LiveStand? Um, LiveStand's primary goal uh, is to provide a rich and engaging content browsing experience for end users. Uh, what's come to be known as the, the digital magazine experience. Uh, but I think that that definition is a little too simplistic for LiveStand. It goes a lot deeper than that. One of the ways in which it goes a lot deeper than that is in providing a highly customizable content experience. Um, and this mainly touches on two avenues, actually. One um, is the way LiveStand is built. Um, it allows LiveStand to display content, and not just content, but also content experiences from multiple external development teams, combine them onto one page for a consolidated content browsing experience. And the other way uh, which LiveStand is, is kind of really different from uh, your run-of-the-mill digital uh, magazine experiences is that we can leverage um, what we know about our relationship with the user, you know, profile information, preference information they've given us, and also what we know about the user um, as they browse through the Yahoo network, what their interests are. So we're not serving up um, you know, Justin Bieber information to someone who's visiting Yahoo for college football news. The third point, um, I think, is really the most exciting. Um, so LiveStand fundamentally um, is designed to work across multiple devices. And when, when we talk about um, multiple devices in kind of the digital magazine scenario, you know, usually uh, other solutions are normally talking about iOS, or if they're really um, enthusiastic, maybe iOS and Android. But what we're talking about here is an experience which I can share across tablets, laptops, notebooks, desktops, and even TVs, for example. Um, you know, so I could be browsing content on the train um, on, my, on my tablet, leave that content where it is, and come back on my 60-inch TV and continue the experience there. And I think that's a, a real value add. That's, that's a real unique piece of value which we'll be in a position to provide. And lastly, um, I won't dig on this too much in terms of the talk and engineering, but along with the rich content presentation, LiveStand also um, allows advertisers to deliver a, a, more, a richer, more engaging ad experience without kind of interfering with the user's browsing of content. So if you consider the mag magazine experience, you're flipping through a magazine, you hit an ad page, you can either choose to engage with it or just flip over it. And, and that's the kind of model LiveStand is going for. But when you engage with a LiveStand ad, you have kind of a more engaging experience, better than magazine, better than TV. So let's stop there, kind of, kind of switch over to demo so you get an idea of kind of what I'll be talking about for the engineering experience for some of the other slides. Does that look OK? okay. Not too fuzzy. So this is kind of what LiveStand looks like when you kick it off. 
you get the, the array of content kind of presented as default. You're able to navigate through it. Explore other content. And kind of drill down into areas of interest. So for me, that would be that, for example. Right, so I can navigate stories. I can drill down into them. I can swipe across stories. Um, somewhere along the way, you might have a video or so in line, and also as a full page experience, and also photo slideshows. And it's not just um, article type content, right? So for example, I can drill, drill down into the stocks module and get a com completely customized content consumption experience uh, where you know, it no longer looks like a magazine, for example. And I can interact with it to gain more value from it. So, so I'll leave you with that screen. That's the screen I'll be using to kind of drill into some of the engineering concepts. So um, keep that in your head. So that's what LifeStand is about. Um, the first engineering decision which comes up is what do we build this thing on, um, you know, given the product definition we looked at earlier. Looking at how the pros and cons break out on either side of the fence, native or web app, um, the most common one which pops up to the top when you're talking about the native stack is that the native stack has deeper access to the device hardware. And, and what I'm talking about here is not just access to the camera or ca access to the accelerometer, for example, but also more control over memory, the ability to monitor memory, the ability to monitor threads um, and reuse threads and that type of thing. It's the, other, the other pro which usually pops up to the top of the native stack when, you, when you're uh, making this type of decision is that native runtimes traditionally perform better. And, and I think this is slightly debatable in the context of an app like LiveStand. And, and you know, just from the user experience you saw here, um, you know, that was a fairly native experience. Um, I think you know, if you're developing something like a game, for example, um, where you had frame rate concerns, um, I think it's a given. You know, at least in today's world, you start with the native implementation. But when you're developing an app which is largely content or data heavy, that really becomes the core bottleneck of the application. So regardless of whether your runtime logic is in JavaScript or on some native stack, you're always going to be looking at some kind of loader or some kind of splash screen while data is being updated to reflect the, 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 you know, the, the newest content. And so I think this is less of an argument um, when you're comparing it for the content slash data driven type of application. Moving over to the con side of the fence, this to me is the biggest deal blocker. Right? Um, on the native side of the fence, you not only have one runtime, but multiple runtimes if you want to kind of enforce the vision behind the LifeStand product idea. Right? So you're going to have to develop this product on iOS, on Android, potentially on Windows down the road. And that really becomes um, cost prohibitive right? and also time prohibitive. Additionally, um, it's a runtime which we as Yahoo, but also you know, I expect most of you out here, um, we'd go, need to go out and find developers for, and not just any developers, because the native stack has its own set of you know, scalability and robustness challenges. So you need to find developers experience, and then you need to replicate them across each of these uh, runtimes. And that's where the, the plural aspect of runtimes really, really comes into play. And the final thing on the con side of the fence is the fact that these runtimes are proprietary. So there's only a limited amount of visibility you get into where they're headed in the future, um, and potentially also a lim limited amount of say. On the web app side of the fence, um, this is the biggest win, right? Is that you have a single runtime, which is available um, in varying degrees, of course, across all the, all, all the scenarios I mentioned. You know, laptops, uh, notebooks, tablets, desktops, and TVs even, right? And things like the PS3, for example. And so you have a runtime in place across all these environments. And that opens up the ability to share code across all the environments. <coughs> 
Additionally, I think a more subtle point is that it's not just the development cost slash time frame, right? It includes maintenance, testing, the QA infrastructure behind each of these environments, and also more subtle things like you know, interactions with UED teams and program manage or product management, for example, and refining definitions. You're going to have to replicate these across multiple runtimes on the native stack. On the web stack, there's kind of one engagement for the entire process. Um, second point is that, you know, all of you guys and Yahoo have a considerable amount of experience in web development, something we've built up over the last you know, 10, 15 years. And that can be immediately applied to de delivering a solution today. Finally, it's a runtime in which we have a certain degree of visibility into and is also not controlled by one entity. Uh, right? So it, it's a runtime we can kind of at least approximately predict where it's going and try and react to. On the con side of the fence, Again, um, it's a runtime which has limited access to the device hardware. That's starting to change. You know, so Google, for example, ex is experimenting with the device API, and you're starting to see Chrome talk to the microphone and to the print driver, for example. Um, but, but to a certain extent, that still is a con on the web app side of the fence. And then the performance issue, uh, which we talked about, which, again, is debatable whether it is a real issue or not in this context. And for the most part, the rest of this talk actually addresses um, how that becomes primarily a non-factor. And so that's where the idea of a hybrid application comes in, um, where you have most of the pros of the web world, um, or the web, web app stack world, um, but you can definitely cross out this. So you provide a native, a thin native layer or bridge across which the web app can communicate with native parts of the device. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned, the performance aspect of it um, will, will Throughout the rest of this uh, discussion, we'll look at how we kind of evened out that um, comparison so that we have an application which has kind of native runtime characteristics. So then um, when it comes to live stand, what sits on which side of the fence? You know, how much is web app? How much is hybrid? And, and the key part about live stand is that virtually all of the UI and application logic is on the web stack. Right? And, and that point kind of goes deeper than just that single line. Um, it basically means, you know, so if you think of web application development in general, and you've probably all encountered this, the web app layer is, or the application layer is a thing which fluctuates the most often, right? So you get weekly updates from UED to tweak something by X pixels or change the orientation of something. You get monthly updates from product folks who say, you know, we want to introduce this kind of wizard in the navigation flow. And if all of that logic was at the native layer, you'd have to replicate all of those tweaks across all of those runtime environments. Keeping all of that logic in the web stack lets you do it once and reuse those implementations um, across the board. In this scenario, the native layer acts more as a services or utility layer. Um, and so that's largely stable. You know, it fluctuates mostly uh, in relation to kind of device uh, characteristics more than product characteristics for the most part. For LiveStand, some of the things which the native services layer does are listed there. Um, I might not have time to dig into all of them. I think that's an entirely separate talk. But we'll touch on the YQL caching aspect, uh, some of the thread control aspect, and, and the multi-web view aspect, if I, if I don't run too far over. So next up is um, what are the core parts of, what are the core parts of uh, YUI which LiveStand ended up using? The ones I'm going to focus on today are, are the modules and dependencies um, aspect of LiveStand and how that ties into the product goal about supporting multiple individual development units which you want to consolidate and composite into one final page at the end of the day. And it plays a key role um, in that product requirement. And the other area I'm going to focus on is the abstraction layer, the node event gestures layer which allows LiveStand to fulfill not only the cross-device uh, promise it has but also, um, on top of that, if you consider all the third-party code, which will eventually be piling up into LiveStand to provide custom content experiences, it allows you to handle that code across environments without having to react to changes. So you're not going through 10,000 lines of third-party code to figure out, did this particular publisher or content provider handle Firefox correctly, or did they handle Safari correctly? They're all building on top of this abstraction layer, and so you can confidently port third-party implementations from one environment to another. So let's dig into the, the modules and dependency aspect a little bit. This is a 
semi-close approximation of the screen uh, we left the demo at, right? So that screen was made up of kind of a news content scroller, um, a sports module, a stocks module, uh, another module. All of these modules in LiveStand are kind of atomic units, so they can deli be delivered by you know, independent development teams who do their, do their own development and deploy them to LiveStand's package management system. And they all get put together on the page uh, by the Mojito MVC framework. I'm not sure how many of you kind of caught the talks and, and the training classes on the MVC infrastructure. Um, and something we're hoping to open source, I think, uh, early 2012, or I shouldn't say early 2012. The only thing I've heard is 2012. Um, and the Mojito MVC framework is the thing responsible for taking all those individual component blocks and putting them together as one page. It sits, it, um, so that, that set of code kind of sits on top of the, the hybrid bridge, the native uh, bridge, if you will. I won't get into too many details on kind of which part touches what. But if we take the stocks module, for example, fundamentally to render that square on the screen um, involves three components. The, the first component is the actual implementation, what uh, Mojito calls a module, a module, if you will. And that consists of the, the markup, the CSS, and JavaScript, uh, which define the behavior and visualization of that model. And, um, so that internally, for example, can come from the live stand team itself. It may come from other Yahoo properties like news and sports and finance. And down the road, I don't believe this is supported in V1, but down the road from third party providers. So National Geographic could provide their own user experience um, so that they didn't have to have the same kind of um, content experience for a user as the rest of the application. And that would all get put together on one page to deliver the, the consolidated live stand experience. So that's the implementation. The next part is the data, obviously, and that's all driven through YQL and for good reason. So YQL provides a standard interface so you don't have code split out, a certain section of which, for example, is talking straight to some API and another part which is talking to some ad hoc database. They all go through the YQL layer to normalize the way data is retrieved uh, for LiveStand. And that, even today, is driven by internal Yahoo data as well as external publisher data. And then the final piece is that the user prof uh, profile slash preferences piece, uh, which configures you know, what shows up on that stocks module we looked at at the end of the day. So all that stuff gets, to, gets put together to create this final stocks module. And if we blow apart that, that module, you see something which looks familiar, finally. right? Um, it, it, it's, it's a set of YUI modules. So we can encapsulate everything which is required about modeling stocks, you know, provi uh, providing the, the event binding for stocks, uh, uh, encapsulating how stock, the stocks module handles events and control. And each of those modules can have dependencies. You know, so they could have YUI dependencies. They could have LiveStand dependencies. They could have Mojito dependencies. And at the end of the day, all that gets put together by loader, which analyzes the dependencies for the page. So you know, stocks has its own set of dependencies. Sports does, news does, weather does. All of that needs to be analyzed so that when you're finally rendering, rendering the complete page, you have the ideal set of code for that page. And that's where loader comes in and YUI's module and dependency infrastructure comes in. The next thing I wanted to touch on was the abstraction layer, right? Uh, the node event and gestures, which I mentioned on the agenda slide. And what this layer actually does is help you from, uh, or pre prevent you from having to go through 10,000 lines of third-party code, like I mentioned, to determine what will work when you need to support Opera, because that's now the default environment on Samsung TVs, for example. Right? If all of this 10,000 lines of code is built on top of a consistent abstraction layer, then you can take one of those pieces of code and just run it on Opera uh, on the Samsung TV, for example, and be confident that it'll work. And, and that's a major benefit. Next couple of slides, I'll highlight some of the interesting kind of sugar it adds on top of the abstraction. But the key value is always the abstraction, right? Um, and that, that's the key value, at least I wanted to highlight for LiveStand. Um, so Node and NodeList, for example, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, but it supports kind of more complex selector syntax, ancestor sugar to find ancestor elements. Um, uh, NodeList supports iteration, again, with fancier selectors. Um, the ability to set content without impacting memory, um, so it does all the memory cleanup for you behind the scenes when you switch out um, inner HTML, if you will. 
Um, another interesting one on the node list front, and this, these are all snippets from Lystan, by the way, slightly abridged. But um, another interesting one for node list um, is the fact that it also supports an array API, um, which not many people may be familiar with. So you can do things like shift and unshift, uh, pop and push on a node list while you're manipulating it. Same kind of thing on the event front. Um, You've got your basic usage and the kind of sugar of holding onto a handle for detachment so you don't have to you know, keep track of the signature you use when you actually subscribed. This is an interesting one, so, uh, and is, is a kind of a function of the hybrid application. Um, the hybrid layer, for example, may want to let the web layer know when the OS puts the application in the background, you know, so when the user switches to another application. Um, and in which case the web app can react and you know, maybe terminate CSS transitions it has going on to free up CPU and memory, or maybe kill any timers it has going um, so it's not taking up JS threads in the background. And same kind of thing when it brings it to the front. And so LifeStand um, generates events on the window uh, for this communication, and the web app listens for those changes and reacts to them to do this kind of cleanup or you know, whatever it needs to do when you resume or suspend it. Similar kind of, kind of thing is available in PhoneGap, if, if you're familiar with that. Uh, this one is mainly there for the once uh, sugar. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with that, but once is a useful construct with events when you only want to subscribe to an event once and then detach yourself. Um, it comes in handy uh, quite a bit. So that's a node, an event, and again, uh, more than highlighting the sugar and value add here, the key point is that it provides an abstraction layer so you don't have to go through 10,000 lines of code with a fine tooth comb when you want to support the next environment. It provides that future safety net. Gestures is another abstraction which we use to abstract pointing devices uh, implementations. Um, so for example, at the app level, you want to code your app so that regardless of whether you do that with a finger or a mouse, your app needs to react in the same way. And so rather than distributing code across the app which says if your mouse or if your touch do this, it's encapsulated in our gesture events, which utilize our synthetic event infrastructure. And so, for example, same thing applies. Uh, LifeStand's Zodiac module, which is used in their horoscope module, um, is built on top of Flick. And so, if I need to port that Zodiac module over to another environment, I don't even need to look at the code inside it. I know that it'll work in that next environment because it's built on top of this abstraction layer, which handles those differences. Same thing, for, for example, for the publications and moving them around. Uh, they're built on top of the gesture move layer. And the TAP implementation is something actually uh, LifeStand rolls themselves, which we'd like to roll back into YUI. We'll look at that in a bit more detail a little later. A little later. And the other interesting note to point out here is that the gesture layer, or the synthetic layer, has access to the same kind of sugar which the, the native DOM events do. So you can use delegate with the gesture events. You can use once with the gesture events. And so for example, tap here is actually using delegate. Take a little detour just to look into how synthetic events are created. I thought it might be interesting. Um, so in the live stand world, um, they, they want to define a tap event. The idea behind the tap event is to really normalize the 300, 400 millisecond delay which you get if you use click directly on touch devices. And so instead of using click, the idea is to use tap and you get fast response uh, regardless of whether or not you're on a mouse-based environment or a touch-based environment. And so to plumb that up, you know, they have some logic which says if I'm on this environment, this is the event I want to use under the hood. Um, they set up a basic uh, blueprint to say when someone, goes, uh, when someone subscribes to, through, to, for tap sorry, through the on interface, this is what I want to do under the hood. And in this case, they set up you know, either a touch start or a mouse down listener, which will handle some logic afterwards. Same kind of thing with de delegate. There may be some uh, parameter parsing they want to do before they dispatch to the delegate system. Um, the more interesting part really comes, comes in here. Um, you can introduce gateway criteria, which help define what a tap is. So in this case, I might want to say, a tap is only something which happens with the left mouse button. If I get a right mouse button, that might be a context menu gesture or something else. But it's definitely not a tap, so I'm not going to respond to anything any further. Same, same thing on, uh, uh, in the handler where you handle the touch end or mouse up, for example. 
uh, you might want to say, if the, if, the, if the finger or the mouse move beyond a certain threshold, this is no longer a tap event. You know, the flick event might fire, or the move event might fire, and they'll be handled at the app level appropriately, but it's not a tap. I don't want to inform the tap listeners. And so that's a really powerful way to encapsulate code, which is otherwise repeated throughout your application logic. So as part of the live stand engagement, um, this is the set of things which uh, we either ended up rolling back into YUI or plan to at some point in time. Um, loader. Um, so we looked at the kind of the complexities of dependency management and the need to calculate uh, the final set of modules on a page uh, when we finally go to render it. And one of the optimizations we made for LiveStand was to take that loader dependency cost and move it over to build time, um, which, which is one of the kind of takeaway rules from this, from this LiveStand engagement in general, is that if there's something which you know at build time, do it at build time. You know, don't take up runtime resources to do it. Um, and that, that's, that's a fact which kind of gets lost along the way, but you'll see it come up a lot in this presentation, something to keep in mind. We'll look at the, the amount of savings that actually generated a little later um, as a segue into uh, the JavaScript conversation. As a kind of consequence of that, uh, LifeStand ended up using get directly when they needed to fetch dynamic pieces of content. And get before 3.4.0, I believe, um, only supported uh, synchronous or serial mode for when, when, you, when you use get to dispatch a request for 10 uh, scripts, for example. So when you call get with 10 scripts, it would load the first one, wait for it to load, load the second one, and so forth. It would introduce serialization programmatically um, in order to maintain execution order. For YUI modules, execution order doesn't matter. You can deliver them on the page in any order. It's the, the order in which you attach them to the Y instance which matters. And so we introduced a parallel get uh, configuration where you can tell get, when you go out to get these 10 files, get them in parallel. And it'll send 10, 10 script files to the browser. And the browser will do whatever throttling it needs to or it does. Um, but otherwise, we don't throttle anything. And we're notified when all 10 scripts come back. And we can initiate the yui.use or attach process. Uh, feature testing is another interesting one. So the Mojito framework, um, uh, originally, the way, the, the way it was constructed, um, the only mode it supported was to have a separate YUI instance for each of those blocks we saw on the screen. So news would be a separate YUI instance, uh, stocks would be a separate YUI instance, so on. And when we profiled that setup, we found that there was some obvious stuff which we were doing for each YUI instance, which could arguably be cached after the first take. Now, so, and feature testing is, is a good example of that. You know, wh when certain modules are analyzing the DOM to figure out which implementations they should be de uh, delivering, that infrastructure is not going to change across instances. And it's something we can cache for the first instance and then reuse for the, for the other instances. There's certain things in Loader, for example, which might apply there too. Uh, the k-weight reduction thing is also an interesting one. Uh, so for 3.4.0, we delivered a node core module. And um, the idea behind this module is that it's the lightest possible abstraction layer we can provide on top of the more modern browsers, the, the web kits of today, if you will. Um, so it doesn't introduce any abstraction logic. It doesn't introduce any sugar. But if you're hell-bent on programming for just one environment today, if you introduce that thin layer, it gives you the future compatibility I was talking about. And so now that you've got the abstraction layer in place, tomorrow when you need to support Firefox, you just introduce additional code to the page. But your application code, those 10,000 lines we were talking about, don't need to change at all. And, and that's, that's something, um, so Node Core uh, is available in 3.4. We need to kind of figure out how that percolates throughout the system. Um, and maybe it's something we do for event too, but uh, that's a kind of TBD at this point. Tap gesture we talked about, that's something we'd like to roll back into YUI, either in its current form or some kind of slightly modified form, but that feature set in general. Scroll view is an interesting one. So in LifeStand's use case, the, the, some of the pages we looked at, if you notice, they had um, scrollable interactions, uh, or quite a few scrollable interactions. So they'd have, for example, 10 to 15 articles in a horizontal scroll, and each of those articles had a vertical scroll associated with them. And so a lot of their pages ended up with uh, close to you know, 10 to 15 scroll view instances or more. And in LifeStand's use case, they didn't really need to programmatically work with any of those scroll views. They just wanted to say, apply scrollability to this part of the DOM and leave it alone. I'm not going to listen for events which are generated from it so that you know, a tab can react to them 
or a button can react to them. I just want to make a part of the screen scrollable, and that's it. And this is something we've been thinking about for YUI in general. Um, so what, what, what LifeStand ended up doing was uh, end up, ended up using portions of the YUI scroll view, yanked out kind of the attribute and custom event infrastructure, and, and, and developed a scroll view which didn't fire uh, any custom events, for example, or didn't have a rich programmatic API, um, but they could still use in their implementation. And if you were at Dave's keynote, there was a point up there about widget light. And that's how we want to try and formalize that approach, because fundamentally, there's two ways in, in which people use widgets. One is the programmatic approach, for example, in something like Yahoo Mail, where they need events fired so they can react to them in other components. But the other use case is where they just want to say, instantiate this thing against this piece of markup, enliven it, add some classes to it so it looks pretty, and I'm done with it. I'm not going to ask for it again. And that, that's what we hope to capture with the widget light approach. If you're familiar with YUI, um, you might know we have node plugins which are trying to capture that, that space. And we want to try and formalize it as two forms of widget so you can progress from a light widget to a widget with a heavier programmatic API without having to kind of change your code if possible. And so th that's on the 3.5 time frame for YUI. The hardware acceleration piece is interesting. Um, we'll get into that when we talk about CSS. Uh, so as I was mentioning, um, this is an older snapshot that the absolute numbers don't really mean anything, but they're, they're there for relative comparison. Um, this was, for example, um, when we're, LifeStand was using Mojito in its individual YUI instance form. And so, uh, well, A, you see the amount of savings we got from taking loader from a runtime process to a build time process where possible, you know, where, where the variables were known at build time. So that's a pretty substantial savings. A couple of other interesting things about this pattern, like I was mentioning, is that um, the way LifeStand was using Mojito at that point in time, we were creating separate YUI instances. And you can see kind of repeated patterns which occur with those repeated YUI instances. Um, the repeated YUI instances are true here, too. And that ended up being a, a, a loader cost, uh, where loader was kind of set it state up to, to determine what's on the page, what's not, which set of modules it supports. And that's also something we could potentially look at optimizing um, so that not only the first instance is, is lighter, but also when you create multiple instances, if we could cache some of that information and reuse it, that would be beneficial. Um, the other interesting pattern you see here is the kind of stripe thing. And that's a function of get, like I was mentioning. So loader, when it uses get, it sends out scripts serially. So you see it going out for script, which is the blue part. That's idle JS time. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and then you see some JavaScript being executed. Then you see some idle time again. And with parallel get, we can kind of compress that idle time and only take that JS hit once at the end when all the scripts are on the page. So that's stuff which is in the pipeline um, for kind of loader performance optimizations. I think Dave's already kicked off that effort. And, and the parallel get is kind of already in there. And loader will end up using parallel get in 3.5.0, probably. Yep. So that's a good segue into what the hell was he using to create these? And that was, a, for me, um, as a JavaScript geek, the most fun part of working on LifeStand. They developed a profiling tool. Um, I think it indicates kind of the amount of engineering effort which went into, li into the LifeStand process. And they created a profiling tool which monitored JavaScript calls on device at the native layer. So there was a minimal amount of overhead. Um, they weren't injecting JavaScript code. They took that trace information massaged it a little, fed it into TraceView, Android's TraceView. And that's what we're looking at here. Um, it's a slightly modified version of TraceView. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time actually digging into that, because I like it. There we go. So this is what this tool looks like. Um, I can drill into pieces of data, which I think is f highly unique. Um, you know, I don't think even Dynatrace has the ability to get a visual, a high level visual to say, this is the big chunk of code I think I need to look at. So I can uh, drill in and out of the view. As I was mentioning, um, and a, a good thing to notice here, um, actually when I zoom all the way out, actually maybe this much, is that a significant part of the cost is that blue chunk. And that blue chunk is idle time. So it's time where JavaScript is not executing. It could be you know, you're retrieving a file, you're parsing a file. GC could be going on. Browser reflows could be going on. But that's time which is not where, where JavaScript isn't doing anything. 
And I think if we could add a native instrumentations layer on top of this to tell us what was going on in that blue time, we'd have the perfect tool to analyze what's going on on device. Um, I think the only better tool I've seen is Dynatrace, frankly. Um, so apart from that interaction, um, you have the ability, obviously, to sort kind of method calls uh, in various ways. You have the ability to analyze them so you can drill up and down between parents and children. Right? And, and let me leave it at the collapse state. So if you look at that collapse state up there, another interesting thing to note is that most of the stuff which bubbles up to the top is really all about DOM access. Right? So we're not talking about really about JavaScript execution. They're methods which are doing something with the DOM, which is kind of something we've always known from the beginning. Even this one, for example, um, is a unique one. So this is the y, uh, YUI attach call. And if I drill down into that, I don't have the methods name mapped. Um, but if you look at the kind of top set of methods there, those are all module callbacks which actually touch the DOM, either to figure something out or to set up some kind of listener or something. Um, and so I, the, the really big takeaway from this is that rather than focusing in on the JavaScript runtime costs, the first thing you should be looking at is stuff we all know about, I.O. costs, uh, DOM manipulation costs, uh, and trying to optimize that whole range um, before you kind of start drilling down into the JavaScript runtime costs. I'll leave that there. Um, there's a lot more you can play around with here. Uh, it's kind of cool, but I don't have time. Oh, so one note worth mentioning in there. I've, I've been um, trying to see if we can open source this product. It would be amazingly useful. And if anything happens on that front, I'll try and let you know. I think there's, since it hooks into Apple private APIs, there might be some issues around that. But, but it would be an amazingly useful tool to put out there. Um, again, I don't think there's anything else in general where you can get on-device profiling information of this depth. I think I said most of this, but I'll get into it. So I don't really have anything interesting to say in kind of the core JavaScript advice, the runtime advice. Like I'm saying, you know, the, the best way to iterate an array or how to avoid function lookup costs and that kind of thing. I think that's the same as everything which has been said before. The stuff which came out of LifeStand, which was interesting to me, um, apart from the first one, which I mentioned, is that most of the JS cost impact is, is, is all about kind of getting the code on the page and parsing it. But one interesting piece uh, was this. And so LiveStand, the way it deploys the JavaScript required for the core functionality is to put it on device. So there's no latency cost here. Um, but we still found that minification reduces parsing costs. Um, and that's why I mentioned it twice, is normally when you talk about minification, you say, yeah, well, that's obvious. You know, you're moving less bytes across the wire. In this case, there is no wire. Um, there's a file I.O. cost, which also uh, gets in the way. But it's nowhere as big as network costs, for example. And I can only imagine, well, one obvious reason why minification would reduce parsing costs is comments and log messages and stuff like that. It just spends less time parsing that stuff out of the tree. Um, another area, and I don't really remember if we had actually concrete data on this, but it might be the line ending aspect, you know, and the fact that that makes it easier for Java, the JavaScript parser to get through this chunk of code. Um, but it, it just seemed interesting. Um, again, as I mentioned, all the JS is on device, but even then we found that file I.O. is expensive. And so, for example, comboing the 20 odd files um, which made up the Mojito infrastructure um, ended up saving about 400 milliseconds um, you know, in, in overall page cost, which is, which is pretty substantial. The last point, um, I'm not sure if it's really actionable, but again, I thought it was interesting. Um, so, with hybrid applications, um, you're running the app inside a UI web view, and they still don't have just-in-time compilation support. And so the, the, the runtime experience you get, even though it's not a major part of the picture, um, still doesn't have the JIT compilation benefits which you get if you ran that same application in a browser. Um, so again, just an interesting note that it's not there. I don't have data to back this up, but it seems like JIT would be useful for something like a library or abstractions, right? So if you, if you profile JavaScript or a YUI application, the thing which bubbles to the top the most is y.mix most of the times. And if the compiler could help us with that problem where it could take mix, convert it to machine code, and any future call to mix execute a lot, 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 lot faster, that would be beneficial. And you're doing a lot of that in a library. So I can only imagine that JIT kind of helps library or helps reduce the cost of an abstraction layer all that much more.
CSS. Uh, I won't have to rush it too much. Uh, CSS. So I think the most interesting part of the CSS discussion is centered around hardware acceleration findings. Um, if you remember the point from scroll view a little earlier. Now, when hardware acceleration burst onto the screen uh, scene, whenever it was, you know, six months, eight months ago, um, the, the feedback was, yeah, enable it everywhere, and everything will have, uh, you know, uh, frame rates which match the native side of the fence. And as with all things software engineering related, you know, that's a trade-off. You get the runtime benefits for memory, and for something like LiveStand, where you have, you know, multiple um, articles in DOM, you know, you're literally um, converting, let's say, you know, 5,000 by 200 pixels or whatever it is as a rasterized layer for the GPU to work with in memory on a pixel by pixel basis. And that quickly leads you to scenarios where you run out of memory, you know, especially when you have the amount of scroll views and content which LifeStand has going on. And so the first uh, thought was, you know, to reduce this memory cost, let's just switch to a non-hardware accelerated uh, snapshot of the DOM or, um, uh, you know, let's flip from 2D to uh, 3D to 2D, if you will, to disable hardware acceleration for this region of the DOM when we're done transitioning. And that did free up memory, um, right? So uh, the GPU could get rid of, uh, rid of that whole composite layer which, was, which it was holding in memory. Um, but then what was found was that the next time you try to scroll something, A, you get a slight initial drag while you get the runtime hit of, re-rasterizing that layer for GPU memory use. And you also get uh, a page flicker, which you guys might have seen in general, where you get that white flash when uh, the page, you know, the, that section of the DOM is being redrawn from the GP, GPU bu buffered content. So the next step from there was, since scroll view needs to maintain some idea of dimension so it knows how far to scroll either way, um, how about visibility hidden? And that also re re uh, resulted in a reduced memory cost. Um, but we found uh, similar runtime issues there where even though there's really nothing to render inside that buffer, it still had to create a buffer of that size and, and incurred a runtime cost. Um, and so the final solution which uh, Lifestand Scroll View ended up going with uh, was a solution where um, they'd only, it was kind of like the old scrollable data table implementation, where they'd only maintain the DOM which was in view at a time plus a page on either side. And so when you'd flick, they'd kind of move the DOM around so you'd always have that scenario. And you'd have a perfectly scalable solution where at any point in time, you're only taking up three pages worth of memory, even though you may have you know, 15, 20, 100 articles um, on either side. Uh, the Translate Z thing is just a note. You know, it introduces stacking context along the lines of you know, position relative in IE. Um, the other takeaway, which is something we discovered as part of LiveStand and YUI, is that the whole hardware acceleration space is still glitchy. Um, I think we've got time. Let me switch here. And so, for example, if I hardware accelerate a region of the screen, I've got the Chrome flag set up to kind of uh, give me a red border around uh, composite layers. And in Chrome, if I hardware accelerate uh, you know, that top element, None of the rest, oh, the rest of the page isn't impacted at all. But if I do the same thing in Safari, um, this is using Safari's debug menu, by the way. Highly recommended, good to mess around with. You can see that it, it hardware accelerates other regions of the screen um, for no apparent reason. I believe this is fixed, um, or at least the lifestyle engineers told me it was fixed in, in, in uh, the most recent WebKit head, uh, but it's still in Safari. An impact of this we found on the scroll view side of the fence uh, when we were dealing with the YUI scroll view was that these incorrectly hardware accelerated regions wouldn't give you the right dimensioning results when you ask for offset width and offset height, which is just nasty. So again, I think the takeaway is that uh, use hardware acceleration sparingly. Uh, uh, Inline structural CSS is uh, somewhat obvious, but it, it boils down to the idea of don't do it runtime, what you can do at build time. So when they're constructing pages in LifeStand, instead of using a link to retrieve CSS resources to save on I.O. costs, um, they're embedded as style blocks in the page. Um, so you, you get that I.O. savings, and it's something which uh, you can do at build time through the Mojito infrastructure. Um, and the, the other side benefit that has is that if you have JS which is executing, you no longer have race conditions where JS, you execute, for example, you're creating a scroll view that depends on dimensions, but the CSS which defines those dimensions comes in later, and so your scroll view 
dimensions are all messed up. The other really uh, interesting thing to come out of the life stand effort, and again, which kind of highlights the amount of engineering effort which goes into these things, is some interesting findings in terms of what triggers a layout or, or a restyle. So the, the life stand performance engineers ended up putting tracing hooks inside web core and found that things like whenever you focus an element through, you know, through the JavaScript layer, it ends up resulting in a layout. Along the same lines, just getting scroll left, you can see it start from the JavaScript side of the stack where it's getting some value, ends up being scroll left. At the end of the day, results in, a, in an updated layout and a recalculation of style. Same thing with offset width. Okay. And these, some of these things we knew about, for example, uh, IE has, has some of these quirks. Um, but it really took a significant amount of engineering effort on the WebKit side to determine that, that something funky is going on there, too. On the HTML side of things, um, there's nothing too radical to discuss. The, the, template, the templating conversation is interesting. Um, from a code maintainability standpoint, um, it makes sense to maintain templates as HTML. You know, you don't have line ending issues and you know white space issues and stuff like that. Um, but again, you don't want to take the runtime hit of can going from HTML to JavaScript strings, which you feed into uh, you know either handlebars or a mustache at runtime. And so Mojito supports a compilation mode in which they compile all the HTML templates for each modget convert them to JS tokenized strings, which can be fed into handlebars or mustache, and, and also encapsulate them as YUI modules and deliver them as a comboed package for that entire modget block we were talking about. So you've got saved I.O. costs, you're offloading your runtime uh, parsing costs, um, and you have a better performing solution. The other note is, is, is interesting. Um, it's highly use case dependent, but um, based on profiling the LifeStan team did, they found that for single-use templates, Mustache ended up being just as, uh, just as fast, if not faster, uh, than handlebars. And kind of taking a step back, this seems somewhat obvious, right? So handlebars provides a significant performance boost for that second template. But in order to do that, it has to go through a compilation step and kind of store some internal representation of the template as an object, an array, the first time you use it, right? And so if you have scenarios where you have many templates which are only used once. Um, all things being equal, um, you know, Mustache turned out to be a better option because it had a lower K-weight cost. Right? The important thing to stress here, though, is that for single use, performance is largely equivalent. You know, so there's not a massive difference. Um, and, and so it all boiled down in the lifestand case to a K-weight decision to say, do I want to take everything Handlebars has or can I do with Mustache because my use case, I'm not using a template more than once. Where you are using a template more than once, Handlebars blows things away because it leverages that compiled implementation the second time around. That link leads to a, a JSPerf type link, uh, which kind of shows the results, but I don't think I have time to go there today. Uh, Video appears to have a memory link when resetting source. That's just something we discovered towards the end of live stand development. It's something I believe which is filed with Apple and other people have hit. I don't actually know how we got around this. I imagine uh, just by blowing away the video element and recreating it. Uh, 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 just another data point. Uh, video, like input on iOS, for example, swallows touch events. So for a lot of these full page applications, um, what people do is you know, uh, listen for touch on, on the document and prevent default to, to uh, avoid the page scrolling behavior uh, which iOS has. And because video swallowed that event, um, that no longer kicked in and they saw a kind of page wiggle um, at the browser level. And so that's where they could tap into the hybrid side of the fence and say, on these types of pages, when I'm displaying video, disable page scrolling from the native side of the fence, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, again, just a data point. The last thing, again, I don't think there's anything you can do to, to resolve this issue, but it points to the amount of engineering effort which went into analyzing performance for LiveStand. What they ended up doing was tracing resource requests at the native level. And in that analysis, they saw that when the hybrid layer dispatched the web, uh, the, the web view to a particular URL, there was close to a 300 millisecond delay before they even saw a request for that resource on the file system. 
So here we're not talking about you know, HTML parsing and that kind of thing. This is just talking about getting to the file system on, uh, getting to the file on the file system in order to give it to the browser. And the only way this is interesting is that when we were doing the full page analysis of the page, you know, we were struggling to figure out how do I cut out this last 500 milliseconds, where is it coming from? And it required that type of analysis to figure out that a big chunk of it is just something we have no control over, at least at this point. Uh, I think this is the last three slides. We should have enough time. Um, so at the end of the day, um, I believe kind of towards the end of lifestand development, we found that a majority uh, of the performance cost was all around data management. Um, and one of the neat things they did, this I think as, as Dave would put it is huge. Um, you'll find it huge when I'm done explaining it. Uh, so if you remember, if you go back to that composite page, right, we had a news module and a stocks module and all the rest of the modules. Overall, that page generates, you know, whatever, eight to 10 YQL requests, which go out across the wire, have IO issues, latency issues, come back. Um, in order to mitigate that cost, what LifeStand ended up doing was taking that runtime cost and making it a build time cost. And so they ran kind of the offline join aggregation process as a script which runs on a server to do that composition. And the client would just issue one YQL request to get that data and, and retrieve it essentially instead of the 10 or 12 IO requests. And the really huge part of it is that the code they used to do that on the server is the exact same code which would do it on the client. So they could just take that Mojit code, deliver it on the server, and have it do exactly what it would do on the client, and everything would still work. Um, the, the Mojito server, uh, in case it wasn't obvious, is a Node.js-based server. Um, and so that, I think, as Dave says, is huge. right? That, that's the holy grail of distributed development to say, I'm going to move stuff wherever the resourcing uh, uh, availability allows me to. The other, so, the other cost they offloaded to, to YQL um, was the normalization. So instead of working with raw data feeds and processing them in JavaScript, they did that as a pre-computed uh, step in YQL. And again, boils down to moving costs, you know, which you can do at build time to build time instead of taking them at runtime. In terms of the local cache to provide the offline experience, uh, LifeStand ended up going with a native uh, SQL cache as opposed to kind of the web-based SQL cache. Uh, one of the core reasons was to get around uh, to provide a promptless caching experience, so you wouldn't see the you know, this application is trying to increase your cache by this much. Do you want to let it? Uh, I imagine that was something to do with the UED decision. But but moving it to the native side meant that they could now leverage a native thread to do database work while the JavaScript thing was doing its thing, and and so they could kind of offload some of that cost to another thread. Uh, the other kind of benefit which came out of it was that they didn't have to implement any type of user security level. So when you log into LiveStand, you know, there could be multiple users using it on the same device. And instead of building a security layer to isolate those users' da offline data, they could just set up a native database in um, each user's home directory, and that would give them the security they needed. A couple of interesting things um, which they were thinking of down the pipeline. Um, when you have scenarios where you're you know, populating a local cache with, say, 30 to 40,000 rows of data, um, that can become a really expensive process if you're inserting rows one at a time to populate your local cache. And so one of the ideas which was floated around, it isn't implemented yet, but I thought was a good idea, was to generate the entire SQL database on the server instead of trying to ask the local cache to populate a row at a time and just move that database down to the client for use. Right? And that's something which the, the native cache allowed them to do, obviously. The other area which seemed interesting to me was, and this might be a function of how local cache was implemented, but the way local cache would update data would be a row at a time. Um, so you know, if you had a row of data and you wanted um, to, to re uh, or update it, you'd, you'd, you'd had no choice but to update it a row at a time. And there are a number of scenarios where, for example, you're looking at a comment thread and initially, you just want to display the title and maybe the poster. And you want to populate your database row for that comment with that information. And then if the user interacts with it, they can go and pull down additional content. And instead of blowing away the whole row, they could incrementally populate the row, um, again, which is interesting. Final, uh, final thing is just a data point, which says you know, even on the native side, they had connection limits uh, just like the browser has. So they were limited to four connections, for example. I think this is pretty much the final slide. Um, 
the hybrid layer is an interesting conversation. I'm not sure if it applies um, to all of us in general. But again, uh, this talk was supposed to be about everything I found interesting is from life stand as an engineer. Um, so there's various ways, uh, or various ways in which the JavaScript layer can be set up to call the native side and vice versa. You know, so once you establish that you've got these two sides, you need some kind of bridging mechanism in place. Um, implementations like PhoneGap, um, as per the data I've received, um, you use window location URL to facilitate that transfer. So when the client wants to talk to the native side, they send the window location URL to something with their data payload. The native side captures um, that location change, uh, says prevent default to stop the page from actually going anywhere, but then processes that data payload. And the subtle artifact of that approach is that in order to get that data back into the, onto the JavaScript side of the fence, they set up a global uh, data, uh, sorry, JavaScript global space in which way they can deliver that payload. And in order to do that, they they need to do a string copy, you know. So, the, so it goes over to the native side. The native side does its processing. It gets the final data set which it wants to deliver to the JavaScript side. It has to do a memory string copy from one memory location to the other, uh, which, if that set of data gets pretty large, can get somewhat expensive. LifeStand's approach was A, to use XHR to initiate those requests. So a, they didn't have to deal with the complexity of preventing default to stop the page from going anywhere. And B, another subtle artifact of that, or probably a conscious artifact actually of that, was that um, you know, you'd send an XHR over to the native side. It would do its processing, get the data which it wanted to feed back to the JavaScript side of the fence. Instead of copying anything anywhere, it could just tell the XHR implementation to point to that memory location. So there's no memory copy cost. All they're doing is changing pointers, and the XHR side has access to that data. And again, so for larger data sets, that becomes uh, somewhat of a performance savings. Uh, the final thing on there is native object uh, or classes exposed to the JS side. I, I believe Android is the only environment which actually allows us to do this. Um, from my understanding, it would be the fastest approach, but it's not available everywhere. Caching YQL, we kind of went over. Multi-web views is interesting. Um, so in order to render uh, a live stand page, there's a certain amount of cost which is involved in booting up, you know, getting YUI on the page, getting Mojito on the page, getting live stand, just core framework infrastructure on the page. In order to get, mitigate that cost as they moved from page to page, um, a solution uh, they came up with was to set up multiple web views. And they'd prime those web views in the background with that basic stack at appropriate times and, and then flip them out so that, that when you switch, switch pages, you wouldn't have to incur that you know, 700 milliseconds or one second cost to boot up that, that basic framework stack. However, that comes with its own engineering overhead. So you know, um, it might not always be the best solution, but it's an interesting solution. Um, so you, know, you need to, because um, each web view they found shares the JavaScript uh, thread, if you're doing something to prime a web view in the background, it can interfere with what's going on in the front. So you know, if the user is interacting with something during mouse move, it'll cause um, a jerkiness in that behavior. And so they had to find prime moments where they could, or ideal moments where they could prime the background web views. And then those issues of you know, when to destroy them and recreate them to free up memory and that kind of thing. An alternate approach uh, may be to pursue a single page application framework. So you only have that framework hit once, and then you can, you can roll back to that clean slate and then build up from there, roll back and build up. And, and so that, 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 I think, would be kind of a smoother approach to, to this whole thing without incurring the multi-web view memory costs. But again, that has its own constraints about memory management for a single page app and, and that kind of thing. Uh, I don't have too long left. Uh, the experiments kind of touch on that whole thing and, and the threading concept aspect. So an interesting idea which popped up initially was that if these environments don't give us native web workers, um, maybe we can use more web views to act as JavaScript threads where we can pawn off work uh, to do while we're doing something in the main view. And that obviously hit the same constraint as the multi-web view implementation, where they really only had one JavaScript thread to work with. So you know, creating another uh, web view to do stuff didn't really provide any benefits. Native JSON parsing is interesting, too. So at one point, they, they considered moving a lot of the business JSON logic parsing over to the native side and found that it actually turned out to be heavier than just doing it in JavaScript. So again, just a data point. So I think that's about it. I didn't go too far over. Um, these are the key takeaways, according to me. Uh, the first one, what I'm really trying to say there is um, 
in the web development world, you know, about, I don't know, six, eight years ago, we moved from the realm of, you know, a bunch of functions which we'd copy and paste everywhere to a more professional uh, realm of JavaScript development where we were reusing code, dealing with object-oriented JavaScript, figuring out what the best way to iterate an array is, you know, what kind of function costs exist when, you, when you're looking up through scope, that kind of thing. And I think now it seems like uh, we need to go a step further and kind of really understand this emerging set of technologies which we're building on top of. The, the hardware acceleration example is a prime example of that, right? Uh, it really invo it involved some insight to understand what, what is this thing doing under the hood to determine when and when not to use it. So I think we're getting into that kind of um, hardcore realm where it's important, it, you know, it, it might not be a day-to-day -day, uh, thing, but it's important to understand, you know, what JIT compilation gives you and how hardware acceleration works and how browsers render. And also when you go to the Node.js side of things, how the server operates. That's, that's a key part of what we do going forward. Second point I think I already touched on is at the end of the day, the things to focus on are the same things we've always seen, is IO costs, data costs, DOM access costs. Once you've tightened those down, then you can start to fine tune kind of the JavaScript runtime side of things. Progressive enhancement is your friend is, is kind of an interesting one. Um, people have started to kind of throw that out the window a little bit. And coming back to the native versus uh, web app uh, decision making, right? I find that as I use more and more native applications which deal with content, they try to do a half-assed thing with progressive enhancement, right? They, show, they throw up a static snapshot of your stale data while they're going out and getting new data. They throw up a splash screen or something like that. And it seems like in the web world, we can do a lot better, right? We can provide a lower fidelity version of the data they're actually waiting for, even make it look pretty while we're booting up the rest of the enhanced infrastructure. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind uh, to help with the, the initial user experience, uh, the perceived performance. And the last one I think I've gone over a bunch of times, and that one is a freebie based on our badass theme. Uh, that's the talk. Um, these are the bunch, I don't see any of them here, I don't think, unless they're hiding. Uh, th this is uh, the core set of people who helped me put together the content for this slide, and also did a lot of the research work behind it. Behind this team is an even bigger team of people, like Matt right here is one of them, who kind of worked on optimizing the Mojito framework and the LiveStand framework to get this stuff to work. Um, that's me, I'm just doing the talking because I'm the prettiest one out of that group. <laughs> Apart from Rick, he's got the British rock star thing going, if you've ever met <laughs> <laughs> That's it, um, well, I, I have to free up the size. Apologies to Felipe, I ate into some of his time, but I can take questions somewhere quiet uh, so we don't disturb Felipe. Thank you.